Blog Talk Radio. Hi, and welcome to Virtues of Peace. I'm so happy to be joined by Dr. Andrew Blom, who is the chairperson of the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Central Michigan University, where he teaches a number of things. But um, in connection with this show, what is of relevance is his teaching of courses on nonviolence and the civil rights movement. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Uh, I'm very grateful to be joining the conversation today. And we're grateful to have you with us. And also with us are Taylor Ackerman. Hello. And Randy Olson. Hello, hello. (laughs) So today's show is titled Plot, Plan, Strategize, Organize, and Mobilize the Solidarity of Human Interests and International Organization. That title is a bit of a mouthful, but I want to draw attention to the first five words, plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize, which come from a recent press conference given by rapper, artist, teacher, known as Killer Mike. I'm going to refer to him as Teacher Mike in this show. Uh, He's also known as Michael Render. He gave this press conference in response to the murder of George Floyd and all of the other injustices that we are facing again in this country. Um, And we're going to be focused on that clip and in particular uh, some things that he says. He says it very briefly. I'm going to just play the clip very soon, but do pay attention to some of the names of individuals and organizations that he mentions in this clip because he is laying out an organizational line that we have been trying to draw attention to in this show for the past few podcasts. So I'm going to play this clip now. It is about eight minutes long, and then we will talk about it and some deeper historical connections afterwards. So here's the clip. I didn't want to come. And I don't want to be here. I'm the son of an Atlanta City police officer. Um, my cousin is an Atlanta City police officer. And my other cousin, East Point police officer. And I got a lot of love and respect for police officers, down to the original eight police officers in Atlanta, that even after becoming police, had to dress in a YMCA because white officers didn't want to get dressed with niggers. And here we are 80 years later. I watched a white officer assassinate a black man. And I know that tore your heart out. And I know it's crippling. And I have nothing positive to say in this moment because I don't want to be here. But I'm responsible to be here because It wasn't just Dr. King and people dressed nicely who marched and protested to progress this city and so many other cities. It was people like my grandmother, people like my aunts and uncles who were members of SCLC and NAACP, and in particular, Reverend James Orange, Mrs. Alice Johnson, and Reverend Love, who we just lost last year. So I'm duty-bound to be here to simply say, that it is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. It is your duty to fortify your own house so that you may be a house of refuge in times of organization. And now is the time to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. It is time to beat up prosecutors you don't like at the voting booth. It is time to hold mayoral offices accountable, chiefs and deputy chiefs. Atlanta is not perfect, but we're a lot better than we ever were, and we're a lot better than cities are. I'm mad as hell. 
I woke up wanting to see the world burn down yesterday. I'm tired of seeing black men die. He casually put his knee on a human being's neck for nine minutes as he died like a zebra in the clutch of a lion's jaw. And we watch it like murder porn over and over again. So that's why children are burning to the ground. They don't know what else to do. And it is the responsibility of us to make this better. Right now, we don't want to see one officer charged. We want to see four officers prosecuted and sentenced. We don't want to see targets burning. We want to see the system that sets up for systemic racism burnt to the ground. And as I sit here in Georgia, Thomas Stevens, Georgia, former vice president of the Confederacy, white man said that law, fundamental law stated that whites were naturally the superior race. And the Confederacy was built on a cornerstone. It's called a cornerstone speech. Look it up. The cornerstone speech that blacks would always be subordinate. That officer believed that speech because he killed that man like an animal. In this city, officers have done horrendous things and they have been prosecuted. This city's cut different. In this city, you can find over 50 restaurants owned by black women. I didn't say minority and I didn't say women of color. So after you burn down your own home, what do you have left but char and ash? CNN, Ted did a great thing. I love CNN, I love Cartoon Network. But I'd like to say to CNN right now, karma's a mother. Stop feeding fear and anger every day. Stop making people feel so fearful. Give them hope. I'm glad they only took down a sign and defaced a building and they're not killing human beings like that policeman did. I'm glad that they only destroyed some brick and mortar and they didn't rip a father from a son. They didn't rip a, fa- a son from a mother like the policeman did. When a man yells for his mother in duress and pain and she's dead, he is essentially yelling, please, God, don't let it happen to me. And we watch that. So my question for us on the other side of this camera is after it burns, will we be left with charred or will we rise like a phoenix out of the ashes that Atlanta has always done? Will we use this as a moment to say that we will not do what other cities have done and in fact, we will get better than we've been. We got good enough to destroy cash bonds. You don't have to worry about going to jail for some petty. We got smart enough to decriminalize marijuana. How smart are we going to be in the next 15 or 20 years to keep us ahead of this curve? So that much like when South Africa suffered apartheid, you had Andy and other politicians that could make sure that Atlanta said, Coca-Cola, we love you. But if you don't pull out of South Africa, we're going to leave. We're not going to drink Coca-Cola anymore. Coca-Cola jumped on their side and apartheid ended. So we have an opportunity now. Because I'm mad, I don't have any good advice. But what I can tell you is that if you sit in your homes tonight, instead of burning your home to the ground, you will have time to properly plot, plan, strategize, and organize, and mobilize in an effective way. And two of the most effective ways is first taking your butt to the computer and making sure you fill out the census so that people know who you are and where you are. The next thing is making sure you exercise your political bully power and going to local elections and beating up the politicians that you don't like. You got a prosecutor sent your partner to jail and you know it was bullshit. Put a new prosecutor in there. Now's your election to do it. You want a different senator that's more progressive that pulls marijuana through? Now is the time to do that. But it is not time to burn down your own home. I love and I respect you. I hate I don't have more to say. I hate I can't fix it in a snap. I hate Atlanta's not perfect for as good as we are. But we have to be better than this moment. We have to be better than burning down our own homes. Because if we lose Atlanta, what else we got? We lose an ability to plot, to plan, to strategize, to organize, and to properly mobilize. I want you to go home. I want you to talk to 10 of your friends. I want you guys to come up with real solutions. I would like for the Atlanta City Police Department to bring back the Community Review Board, one that Alice Johnson was formerly under, under Chief Turner. We need a review board here ahead of it before an officer does some stupid shit. We need to get ahead of it. That's my recommendation to my mayor. 
and my chief. Let's get a review. Well, let's get ahead of it and let's give them power. We don't need an officer that makes a mistake once, twice, three times, and finally he kills a boy on national TV, and the next thing you know, the country is burning down. We don't need a dumbass president repeating what segregation is said. When you start looting, we start shooting. But the problem is some officers black, and some people going to shoot back. And that's not good for our community either. I love and respect you all. I hope that we find a way out of it, because I don't have the answers, but I do know we must plot we must plan, we must strategize, organize, and mobilize. Thank you for allowing me some time to speak. I'd like to appreciate our chief for what she said on YouTube. I thought it was very bold to do. I'd like to appreciate our mayor for talking to us like a black mama and telling us to take our ass at home. And I'd like to talk, I'd like to thank my friend for convincing me to come here. And I'll defer to Joe Beasley now because he knows a hell of a lot more than we do. Thank you. All right, so such a powerful clip um, and to just give it some context with the shows that we have done before the shows that we will be doing um, our last show was called organize the world and that phrase was a catchphrase of the peace through law movement and as we've been saying that it's not just about being against something it's about working for something and organization is a crucial part of this and what we have said is that part of this organization involves education and that clip you see um, Michael Redner laying out all of this history very very quickly um, going back to 80 years uh, and mentioning individuals and organizations, as I have said. So I would like to turn to Andy Blom, uh, who, as I have mentioned, is an expert on this history about the civil rights movement. Um, and one of the organizations that is mentioned, Andy, is the SCLC. <clears throat> and um, eventually I would like you to talk about that, but please, if you have some general comments on the on the clip and the the thread that uh, is being laid out please contribute thank you uh yeah i there in in what uh killer mike teacher mike uh, uh was just saying there I, I find there's so much deep emotion to connect with and so much deep thought to grapple with there uh you know, for in this moment, um, for him to be talking about what it is that we learn from uh, the anger, the outrage, the, as he said, desire to just burn it all down at this moment, uh, what we can learn if we listen, I think, is so powerful. Uh, it reminds me of, um, you know, that we've been here uh, many times before uh, in late in the civil rights movement after 10, 15 years of continuous struggle throughout the late 50s and 60s, building, of course, on decades and generations of struggle before uh, the United States saw many, many riots, um, which some prefer to call uh, urban uprisings, rebellions, um, because, uh, you know, a, a riot can seem senseless, but an uprising is, is for something. Uh, and uh, in the late 1960s, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was often asked his opinions as a leader in the nonviolent movement about what he thought about the property destruction and uh, the uh, quote unquote disorder uh, that uh, that was was occurring in so many cities across the, the country. And so in 1967, he gave an address, uh, which he would call the other America, you can look this up online, uh, you can you can find on YouTube, the, the full address, the other America, the whole thing, uh, again, is is full of uh, so much depth and so much deep thought to connect with. Uh, but it's in that in that address that he uh, says the line that you may have heard quoted in the media in the last week or so, that a riot is the language of the unheard. 
And uh, he says this in context, and, and he, the, just as, as Killer Mike does, that um, the riot, the uh, uprising, uh, this kind of destruction, this kind of um, desire to, to, to burn down uh, the system that exists around you grows out of unjust conditions. And so Dr. King says, certain conditions continue to exist in our society. This is a quote, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. Uh, and you can go and find that speech and, uh, and read the rest of what he has to say there. But what I hear in Killer Mike's address is a, a similar sort of contextualization, a similar sort of insistence that Yes, he can get up there and say, uh, let's not burn down our own house. Um, at the same time, recognizing that he woke up with a desire to just have the world burn because the uh, injustice, uh, the systemic uh, racist injustice of the world that he exists in needs to be burned down. And people sometimes don't know where to, what to, what to go after. What do you burn down? Uh, and so he offers some um, some a, a little bit, you know, outline of a kind of constructive program in his uh, in his address. Uh, but w crucially, and this is what yeah, yeah, uh, you had pointed out before, uh, what he does is he connects this back to a legacy, to a lineage, uh, to organizers who had come before, uh, in particular those uh, in Atlanta, which was the seat of the, what he, what he named the SCLC, which stands for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, which was one of the major organizing institutions, major organizations uh, of the civil rights movements of the, of the, of the mid 20th century. So I can introduce a little bit more if we think about the uh, SCLC and some of the people that he named. I think uh, to my mind, uh, the best way to understand what the SCLC is, is to understand why it came about, who helped to bring it about, the previous organizers who helped to bring, it, bring the SCLC to the point where uh, it could be such an organizing force in the movement. And so I'm going to offer three really quick uh, vignettes about three people, some, some of whom names may be familiar, some uh, may not. Uh, the, uh, these are three women who were active in the civil rights movement, um, three African-American women. The first of whom I'm going to mention will be a familiar name, uh, and this is Rosa Parks. You can't understand where the SCLC comes from until you understand uh, more fully the story of Rosa Parks, because uh, it was in 1955 that Rosa Parks conscientiously refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus when she was ordered by the white bus driver to give up her seat to a white man. And we know that part of the story. Uh, what we often are, the story that we often get is, well, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Uh, the country saw the error of its ways uh, in her conscientious refusal and changed the laws and got rid of segregation uh, on city buses and the civil rights movement was precipitated from there. So that's that piece of the story that most folks in the United States, probably most folks around the world are familiar with when we hear the name Rosa Parks. What we often, uh, but what we don't know and what we, what the part of the story that we, we aren't told uh, is that uh, Rosa Parks was an organizer before that one day in December in 1955 uh, and she was an organizer in an organization in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, the, a, a cha the, the local chapter of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored, Pe Colored People. 
which at that point was already a 50-year-old organization. It's an organization that continues to be active today. Uh, well, Rosa Parks was a secretary in her local chapter of the NAACP. She uh, had previously gone to learn about the philosophy of nonviolence and nonviolent strategy by attending a school in Tennessee called the Highlander Folk School. Uh, it's another great thing to Google. Google the Highlander Folk School, learn more about it. Uh, before that day on the bus, uh, Rosa Parks had already been involved in efforts to undo racial segregation uh, in, in Montgomery, in particular in the bus system. And uh, she wasn't the first who had refused to give up her, uh, her seat. Uh, and in fact, the NAACP was looking for a test case, was looking for a case of somebody, of somebody being thrown off of a bus, denied uh, access to equal seating on a bus that they could take into the courts in order to push precedents forward and erode the system of racial segregation. Rosa Parks knew this. She knew what she was doing. She knew that she would potentially be precipitating a test case. Um, so her conscientious choice wasn't just a moment of bravery or being fed up or sometimes we're told being tired. Um, this was, uh, this was a, the move of an organizer uh, who understood that she existed as part of, of, of something bigger. So Rosa Parks is the first person I think we need to understand. The second person I want to name, and this may be a name that is less familiar, is Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson uh, was all, also living in Montgomery, Alabama at that time. She was a professor at Alabama State College. She was a member, uh, one of the leading members of a group called the Women's Political Council in Montgomery. The Women's Political Council was an organization uh, whose goal it was to get, to get black women in Montgomery more politically engaged and involved uh, in political reform and changes in the city. One of the goals that Joanne Robinson had taken on when she had been uh, thrown uh, out of her seat on a bus after, shortly after moving to Montgomery was to uh, undo racial segregation, to uh, uh, on, 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 on the Montgomery City buses. Um, she, within the Women's Political Council, had already started a plan uh, for how the uh, black riders of the bus system in Montgomery could leverage the city into changes by threatening or engaging in a boycott of the city buses. And so when Rosa Parks was arrested that day in December in 1955, Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council already had started to plan, plot, organize, strategize how to leverage the power of that moment to make change within the city. Uh, they were able in the course of just a few days to get the word out to 40,000 riders, 40,000 black riders of the bus system in Montgomery uh, to have a complete boycott of the bus system. Um, just days after, after Rosa Parks was arrested. And remember, this is in the days before getting out the word on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and even email, right? So this was, this was people doing the work of going out and, you know, running off mimeograph copies and going out and talking to people at open meetings and spreading the word through the community that there was going to be a boycott. And, uh, and it was a universal um, boycott of Black riders in the city for that one day. Well, that one day boycott was so successful that people got together and planned, plot, organized, strategized, mobilized, figured out how to continue the boycott. And the story of that boycott is that it continued for an entire year. So people who were dependent upon the bus system in Montgomery uh, to get around had to figure out how to make their lives work for a whole year uh, without riding on the bus system. And in order to do that, they needed help from uh, within Montgomery. And so Montgomery got more organized. A lot of that help came out of the churches in Montgomery. There was a new preacher in town who had just gotten his new ministership um, uh, at a church in Montgomery. And his name was Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and he, became, he was identified as a young, um, uh, well-liked, um, very um, charismatic uh, spokesperson for the movement, and that's how he got his entrance into nonviolent organizing uh, within Montgomery um, and what catapulted him into the national spotlight. And uh, the 
and churches from throughout the South in communities who were also uh, doing the same work of trying to undo ra ra racial segregation in their communities were inspired by the boycott, knew, connected it to their own local efforts, organized resources to send to Montgomery to help the boycotters last an entire year through the boycott. Churches were collecting shoes because people were literally wearing out the soles of their shoes, walking to their jobs, walking to their schools, um, walking to get everywhere in the city because they didn't have access to the buses. They were refusing access to the buses. So, uh, and, and people organized from the, the north as well and organized resources and took up collections. Uh, and one of those organizers in the north was another woman, this is the third person I want to introduce you to, uh, named Ella Baker. Ella Baker was not originally from the north. She grew up in, uh, in the south and in, in, in uh, North Carolina. She ended up going to college at Shaw University in North Carolina, but she had moved to New York City. She herself got involved with several organizations in New York City, uh, including the, the Young Negro Cooperative League. Uh, she, you can Google that. The NAACP. She became a traveling uh, uh, secretary for the NAACP, going around and organizing different chapters around the country. Uh, and she organized a group uh, along with another person named Bayard Rustin, another name that you may know from the civil rights movement. And if you don't, please Google Bayard Rustin. Uh, they got together and, or, and mobilized donations from the North uh, in a, a group called In Friendship to send donations down to Montgomery. Uh, Ella Baker visited Montgomery. She became one of the uh, organizing forces within the city during that, uh, that year-long boycott. And so wh what you see happening throughout the year is not just a single tactic, we're going to boycott the bus systems, but a continual organizing um, through multiple organizations, through churches, through, um, through this network of donors from the North, uh, across, um, across the South, through different communities, through, the, through existing organizations like the NAACP, uh, through orga existing organizations like the, the Women's Political Council. And you see them building um, coalitions and figuring out how they're going to work together and combine their power during this time. Uh, and so it wasn't like a single leader. It wasn't Martin Luther King just sort of showed up and, every, and he knew the plan and he told everybody what to do. It was existing organizers that were able to leverage the work that they'd already done to bring that in and make, uh, make their coalition more powerful. And Ella Baker really, really understood and appreciated that strategy. And so when ministers like Martin Luther King and, and other ministers from across the, the South in, in black churches that were socially active, decided that they wanted to build a network, uh, a conference, a leadership conference of Southern Christians, the SCLC. Uh, they, um, they created this, this network of churches from across the South um, to support each other in their activism. And they selected as the first executive director of the SCLC, this woman, Ella Baker, uh, who had been a lifeline organizer, but had learned that from other organizations. And so I think when you start to get deeper into this history, instead of just picking out a couple of names and a couple of moments that seem like they come out of nowhere and make big changes, you start to realize that there's this huge underground network of planning, plotting, organizing, strategizing that has been happening over years and years and generations and generations. Uh, and that many of those earlier struggles may not have seemed successful to the people who were involved in them. They might not have realized what you know, when the Women's Political Council started to plan, to, to, to plan its boycott, it might have never imagined that there would be a moment where they'd be able to carry this out and sustain it for a year. They were hoping for a day, and they were hoping to get just a couple of concessions out of the, the city. But uh, because of the work that they did, uh, they were able to leverage a huge amount of, uh, of power uh, and bring other people into the, into the struggle. Uh, so funny. for me, I think there's so many lessons to be pulled out of this history. I mean, <laughs> it's an incredible story. And, and as you pointed out, the NAACP, that comes into existence in the early 1900s, right? Do you know the exact year? Uh, 1909, I think it's, it's yeah, 1909, okay. I believe. So, and like, I'm sure the existence of that um, and persisting for so long had uh, a great help on these smaller organizations and this networking. <clears throat> and thank you so much for that history. And I'll definitely, on the show resources page, 
um, at the very least put up the other America, the speech by Martin Luther King Jr. that you mentioned. But um, the NAACP, if I recall, one of the co-founders was Oswald Garrison Villard, who's the grandson of William Lloyd Garrison. <laughs> and that that gets to the second part of the show, which is, as Andy has been saying, there's just like this huge underground web of organizing that's behind these moments. And it goes all the way back. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to you know, transition to the second part of the show. I didn't, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but um, William Lloyd Garrison worked alongside Frederick Douglass. If you don't know who William Lloyd Garrison was, uh, he was an abolitionist, and he founded a newspaper uh, called The Liberator, and he spoke about anti-slavery, and he was also aligned with the women's suffrage movement. So these organizations overlapped, um, <clears throat> but just like the SCLC, as you're pointing out, arises, like it's just sort of like this holding tank for these other smaller organizations. Is that an accurate descriptor, Andy? It's like this sort of main organization and these other smaller organizations are members of it. Is that an accurate description? Yes, in the way that it operated, perhaps not so much in it in how it thought of its own structure, but it served as a. I guess I, I'm thinking of almost like a like a hub with spokes. <laughs> you know, it was the mm. hub that other organizations were able to connect into, uh, created a network for them to flow and interconnect with each other. So, would you would you say it's like a federation? Uh, in in some ways, I mean the the SCLC it itself um, was really centered very strongly around the leadership of ministers of particular churches in the South. But for each of those churches that was a member of that organization, there are lots of other local organizations, much like the Women's Political Council or the NAACP, who would connect in with, hook in with uh, mm -hmm. the, the activism and the leadership structure of the SCLC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for that clarification. So before I, I um, do this pivot to uh, really 1848-1888, um, you can call in if you have a question. We're trying to follow an outline, but there's so much history here, and we need it needs to be gotten out finally. Um, so feel free to call in at 516-387-1449 if you have a question. I will also open it up to uh, the other individuals on the call. Um, Keller or Randy, do you yeah. have any? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh, no. Go ahead. All right. So uh, I have, first I'd like to comment briefly about the, the, the teacher Mike clip. Um, something really amazing to me about the way he presented his anger, which was so constructive and so powerful. And I just want to come back to that br very briefly. Um, you know, like the definition of resentment is it's like a form of anger that emerges as a response to the ex the experience of injustice, right? So when you're feeling like something isn't fair and you get mad, it's resentment. And resentment leads to bitterness, and bitterness leads to worse places. And if it doesn't have a place to go, it turns into like this untargeted aggression. And very much like, you know, if an arm breaks – you know, you need to set it and re-break it in order for it to heal properly. He's presented a method precisely in tune with what would heal the broken system. Like, go break the things that are broken and then set them in, a, in line so that they can heal. And I just wanted to uh, mention that briefly before, um, before I build on the, the speech by Frederick that um, – I know we're going to be going into more. Cool. So, yeah. Um, so before I do that, I, I, I know I cut Taylor off. Oh no! I uh, I just I, I was going to say I I don't fully agree with um, Taylor Mike's perspective on the protest 
I think they have been constructive in many ways. Um, uh, maybe property damage is obviously not ideal, um, but I do think that when we're looking at should you sit up the house or should you go out and protest, um, I mean, that's obviously a personal decision, but I think um, when we're looking at what's happened in this country, and he does acknowledge this, and I, I do agree with him about organizing and plotting and, and preparing. Um, there is, you know, a difference between sitting down at your house and property damage. Um, so I think it's very clear to, like, point out that there is this middle ground of you protest, and that's probably the ideal solution for someone compared to sitting on their couch or um, not doing anything at all. And protest or at least the right to assemble and is a constitutional right and property yeah. damage is, is illegal. Um, and before Randy uh, uh, transitions with the quote that he has in mind, I just want to point out because um, <clears throat> we're throwing out a lot of history here and we're trying to draw connections between, you know, the, the abolition movement, the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement and the peace movement. And um, the the suffrage movement in the UK did use property destruction. Um, so <clears throat> windows were broken and so forth. And when Alice Paul of the National Women's Party took over uh, the movement in the United States in 1913, it was a conscious decision not to uh engage in any property destruction whatsoever. And I just want to point to that as another story that will eventually come out um, <clears throat> about how they uh, organized, mobilized uh, in a way that did not involve property destruction. Uh, so, Randy, back to you. Did you want to share uh, uh, this yeah, passage yeah. from Frederick Douglass? Can I, can I, and let me just set up the, um, the speech. Uh, the speech is given at the inaugural meeting of the International Council of Women. I haven't explained what that is really, but just know that this thing formed in 1888. It was the very first meeting of this new organization, this international organization of women, and Frederick Douglass was there. I also want to say that Frederick Douglass's last day on earth was spent with this U.S. chapter of the International Council of Women. It's actually you know, extraordinary. And if you look on our show resources page, his original obituary from 1895 is there for you to read, as well as the memorial that the U.S. chapter of the International Council of Women gave to him during their conference. So he, like this conference was like two weeks long. And Frederick Douglass died during the conference. So while the conference is still in session, the meeting is still in session, they, you know, they, they spend some time acknowledging him, and I've added that to the show resources page. So what you're hearing now from, from Randy is just a sentence from Frederick Douglass's speech at the 1888 inaugural meeting of the International Council of Women. Yeah, so, um, so Douglass says, it was a great thing for the friends of peace to organize in opposition to war. It was a great thing for the friends of temperance to organize against intemperance. It was a great thing for humane people to organize in opposition to slavery. But it was a much greater thing in view of all the circumstances for woman to organize herself in opposition to her exclusion from participation in government. The reason is obvious. Now, I, I selected this, uh, and I think that I'd like to use, actually, the imagery that Dr. Blom presented, uh, which is this idea of a wheel, right? I love that. The, the imagery makes it so helpful for me, where there's all these different directions through which people as individuals can contribute to making the world better. And, you know, there were people at the time who really believed that like prohibit, like prohibiting alcohol was the most important way to move forward in the world. And there were different groups of people that had different 
activities that they believe were the, the next step that needed to take place. And this International Council of Women was this hub, the central place where, where leaders from all of these different silos came together to share progress about how humanity was moving forward. And it was women doing this well before political enfranchisement. And that's so, so unbelievable to me. And furthermore, um, and fundamentally, you know, that, at the very end of the quote uh, that I selected, he, he says the reason is obvious, right? Like women needing to be empowered politically is really important. Why? Well, <laughs> the, the, there's a numbers game here that we can't ignore. And if 50% aren't in the game, it's not democracy, right? It's not, it's, it's, complete, it's, it's certainly not democracy, right? The voice of the people and half of the people not being in the game, it doesn't get more obvious than that. So, you know, I could go on and on, but, you know, fundamentally, I think I'll go back to the Cicero, right? And, and he, he said, nature has implanted in the human race so great a need of virtue. And that's been true and it continues to be true. And everybody has their own direction through which they as an individual can contribute to the improvement of, uh, of humanity, of the human race. And this International Council of Women was this giant, amazing organization whereupon people from all different directions trying to make their corners of the world a little bit better came together to share progress and share resources and be this big network to make everything move a little bit, a little bit better. Yeah. And just to build upon Andy's point about how, you know, Rosa Parks didn't just, the bus boycott didn't just happen. You know, it arose out of all of this prior organization and the international council of women uh fits that description as well because this meeting at which frederick Douglass was present was the 40th anniversary of the very historic 1848 seneca falls meeting the first women's rights convention and guess who was there also frederick Douglass. <laughs> And in his speech, which you can download on the show resources page, he says, wow, you know, um, it's it's amazing that this, like, a little group of people of us gathered together, and that was 40 years ago. And look how far we've come in 40 years, that this is now an international organization. And Seneca Falls happened because of prior organization – around the anti-slavery abolition movement. And in 1840, there was a London anti-slavery convention, and there were credentialed delegates from the United States, one of whom was Lucretia Mott, a woman. And uh, there were other women there as well, but basically the women were not allowed to participate in this 1840 London Anti-Slavery Convention. Frederick Douglass was not at that convention. He did not make it to Europe for the first time until 1845, but he was in the United States uh, in 1840. But who was there was William Lloyd Garrison. (laughs) And, And he sat in solidarity with the women who were organized not around themselves, not around their own emancipation, but for the emancipation of slaves. And this was a defining moment because women saw that they couldn't speak because they were women. This is in 1840, not even to help the other, if you will. And so at that point, uh, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton meet and they say, well, we need to have our own convention. Now, That's in 1840. I love the story because it's so human. Eight years later, Seneca Falls happens. Uh, I love the story because it's, you know, eight years it takes sometimes to uh, do what you say you're going to do. Um, And Frederick Douglass is there at that point. And then this International Council of Women, um, 40 years later, is, is arising out of all of this prior organization. And as I mentioned, uh, 
William Lloyd Garrison's grandson was one of the co-founders of the the NAACP, and of course that was one of the organizations referenced in Killer Mike's speech. He mentions the YMCA, he mentions the SCLC, and he mentions the NAACP. So these have long histories. Does anybody want to add or comment on any of that long thread of organizational history? Yeah, I think there's another um, another sentence that um, he says uh, in his speech, which is, when I ran away from slavery, it was for myself, and I advocated emancipation, it was for my people, but when I stood up for the right of women, self was out of the question, and I found a little nobility in the act. Um, it's kind of similar to um, the woman that went to the anti-slavery convention, um, and I think it, it says a lot about how we should um, continue to stand up for people um, and not just for ourselves and our own group. Um, mm. And uh, I think there's a lot of conversation. There are a lot of conversations happening right now about what it means to be an ally, um, and I think it's important to like look back at these last. Um, at, our, at our history and uh, look at the red thread and see how to how to proceed, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that, that quote um, <clears throat> is so powerful and it, it, it so reminds me, uh, I think that was the last show that we had, I, I ended with a quote from Susan B. Anthony. And by the way, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass were very, very, very close. Um, and Susan B. Anthony, of course, was there at the meeting, the 1895 meeting, where Frederick Douglass spent his last day on earth and so forth. And you can read those proceedings. They're, they're very, very moving. Um, but the last show, the last week, ended with a quote from Susan B. Anthony, which says some, it's, she says this in 1899, actually, at the meeting of the International Council of Women in London in 1899, and she says something like, there's too much focus on the I and not enough on the you. So not enough attention paid to the other. And Susan B. Anthony really embodied uh, what it looked like to work for the other. <clears throat> um, anybody else with a comment on this long thread? Yeah, yeah, briefly. Um this this emphasis on on you know focusing on the you, it comes up in every spiritual tradition that I've ever encountered. You know this idea that like meaningful life it emerges out of doing acts for others, and you know we all as individuals have to orient ourselves towards making this a better world for everyone, not just for ourselves. And it just so happens that when it's better for everyone, it's also better for ourselves. But that sneaks in later. And, you know, just like to echo uh, uh, Teacher Mike's sentiment, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't help the matter if we burn our own house down, right? Uh, using the same analogy I used earlier, right? If I break my arm, in, in the process of fixing the arm, you know, you have to – you have to set it into place, but it won't help if you break the leg. You know, it's not going to heal your arm. And I, I know it's super simplified, but in the same way, like in, if there's a problem in the political system, we have to do our destruction and reconstruction within the political system. And I think that, you know, we have beautiful examples from the women's suffrage movement that show how that kind of organization can proceed step by step into making things unbelievably better than they were at a really, really fast pace, especially when we start to look around 1899, 1888, like these, these pockets of time where an enormous amount of organizational energy gets pulled into one room. And then the results from that spiral upwards into you know, into divine territory really quickly and things clearly start to be improved all over the place. And it has everything to do with these meetings by these specific people. And so I'm mm. happy that we're going into it. Mm. Um, anybody else? I I could build a little bit there too. In fact, I, I, I might say something here. I want to, I want to, complicate even a little bit the picture, Randy, that you were just presenting as well, in much the way that uh, uh, Taylor was looking to complicate uh, Killer Mike's, Teacher Mike's um, uh, 
critique of of the property destruction and, and the, the the riots. Um, you know, I think one thing that I I always try to hold in view when we think about the way that social change happens is that um, I do think that it's necessary at a, for um, political and legal changes to happen, but they often don't happen just because we're going through the regular political processes. And in some ways, that's the advice that teacher Mike was giving was, you know, as part of your planning, plotting, strategizing, organizing, uh, mobilize your vote, go and vote these people out of office and get it, get in folks who are going to better represent your interests. Um, and that certainly is one important strategy. Uh, but also, that's not the strategy that could have worked for uh, Rosa Parks, for jo for Joanne Robinson, for for Ella Baker, Baker for Martin Luther King, um, when they were organizing, strategizing, part of what they were doing with nonviolent action was not just uh, sending a, making an ethical point or sending an ethical message. They were doing that. That was a part of the the strategy uh, and part of its its effectiveness. But uh, they were also coercing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. nonviolent action can be coercive. It can it places your adversary in a position where um, their calculations have to change. The city of Montgomery had to have their economic uh, interests altered by the massive disruption brought about by the by the boycott. Now, it wasn't property damage, um, but it also was. So I think that's as, as Taylor was saying before. There's a large spectrum of political action here. There's a whole lot between staying at home and going out and, uh, and destroying property. There's protests, but there's also coercive direct action. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of political action um, that's often needed to, to, to force social change. Yeah, I, uh, coercion and um, in international relations, coercion is defined uh, as the power to hurt. And uh, you're administering pain, not necessarily violent pain, but economic pain. In the case of the National Women's Party, Alice Paul was administering pain um, by not voting for any anybody, Democrat or Republican, uh, who was against suffrage. So uh, coercion. I just want to, you know, it doesn't doesn't sound very nice, but um, it is the infliction of discomfort and pain. Um, and we need to figure out how to do that in a nonviolent way. So there's a wonderful book that influenced Martin Luther King called Nonviolent Coercion by Clarence March Case, I think published in 1919. Um, so coercion is extremely important. And I, th I think, um, you know, President Trump's uh, response to the protest the protesters, um, like we're going to crack down with military force and so forth, and I'm going to enlist the governors. Uh, if they if they if they don't do this, I'm going to do it. Is really coming from this very archaic model of uh, uh, violent diplomacy, if you will, um, and uh, I don't think that's the the right thing to do. I I also wanted to say, um, going back to this point about like these meetings are so important. Uh, what we've been trying to do in these series of shows is draw attention to organization at all these different levels. So internationally, really haven't talked about international so much this show, but that will come up. Domestic and individual. Uh, all of these are important pieces of the puzzle. And I want to read a quote. It's um, a few sentences. It's uh, from Frederick Douglass's speech. And it's not Frederick Douglass himself, it's Susan B. Anthony um, announcing and introducing Frederick Douglass. And I'll explain while I'm reading this after I read it, but here it comes, and it's on page 327. The Seneca Falls Convention adjourned to meet two weeks after in Rochester, and my mother and father and sister Mary, though not at Seneca Falls, were at the Rochester meeting. I was teaching at school in eastern New York and in August following these two meetings. I went home to Rochester, and they told me all about Lucretia Mott and her beautiful face and words and about Mrs. Stanton, how beautiful and grand. Never were such words spoken by anybody. My father was most enthusiastic about it, and I laughed and said, I think you are getting a good deal ahead of the times. 
to vote, didn't want to vote, and I didn't. And but what I did want was equal pay for equal work. On, I now introduce you to Frederick Douglass. <laughs> I mean, these meetings. Uh, what, what, what's so striking about this passage is, you know, Susan B. Anthony is not at the Seneca Fall meetings, but she hears about them from her family, um, and the family transmits to her this energy and this electricity. And Susan B. Anthony's consciousness is raised because of that, because she says, I wasn't ready to vote. I thought my father was ahead of his time, <laughs> and I just wanted equal pay. And so that little bit right there, and again, she introduces Frederick Douglass, um, yeah, says so much about these, these, like, small, these, these small domains where individuals are sharing with other individuals. And so at the end of Teacher Mike's speech, he says, I want you to go home and I want you to talk to 10 people, you know. Um, <clears throat> so it's, that's also extremely important in this organization uh, and this development towards international peace and justice. I leave it open to anybody to comment when we have about four minutes left. Yeah, briefly, uh, I just kind of wanted to unpack as quickly as I can what these meetings are, right? So the International Council of Women, there's delegates that are at this meeting that are representing groups of people. And those delegates are from, you know, smaller communities of, of people who are also organized within a, within a kind of community, right? So mm -hmm. the National Council of Women in the United States has delegates to, that, they, that they send to the International Council of Women. And some of the names end up overlapping. But then there are local councils of women in cities all over the country, and the local councils of women are doing projects all over town, you know, cleaning up the streets, building schools, the, the kind of, you know, boots on the ground kinds of stuff that, you, you know, you don't have large scale national organizations doing things without, without people doing the individual work all the way down at the grassroots level. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to like build that structure. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Great point. Yeah, I think it's also worth considering that we um, are, you know, in a pandemic and we've had to learn what it means to meet even though we're not in person. And so when we're looking at these uh, different um, meetings in the past, um, how can we kind of translate organization and organizational sort of meetings um, to the present day when, you know, large gatherings aren't possible? Mm -hmm. Andy? Yeah, I think, I think Taylor makes a really good point here. And, uh, you know, what does it mean to come together? What does it ne mean to meet uh, in the age of the pandemic? And I, I, just one thought I had as, as Taylor was describing that problem is, you know, of course, social media and some of the other platforms that we've been using have been one channel through which that kind of meeting can happen. Uh, Certainly, look, it's going to look very different than what it looked like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Uh, one of the things that I recognize about the current moment is uh, how quickly a lot of local organizations were able to mobilize for protest. Uh, and that's also because organizers have been building over the last number of years uh, to um, uh, to create a, a, a local network, a local organization for the Black Lives Matter movement. And that didn't all exist uh, before people organized around the killing of Trayvon Martin, the killing of mm. uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson five, mm. uh, uh, you know, what is it now? Six years ago for Ferguson mm -hmm. and, and uh, nine, nine years ago now for Trayvon Martin. And so um, there people have been, building during that time and it made it um it made it possible for folks to to organize and mobilize people through social media even during a pandemic uh right now hmm. right with 60 seconds less left let me say that um this thread of history that we've been talking about and thank you so much for mentioning trayvon martin and michael brown and <laughs> that's five six years ago um and that is 
another part of the story that's extremely important. And uh, those names have not been uttered as much as they should be uh, in connection with the events of the last couple of weeks. But uh, let's hope that in addition to the speed that which we're seeing people organize, we also see strength and persistence because these things do take time. Um, and what we now have to await is, you know, the the results of the trials of these policemen. And uh, <clears throat> that wasn't a happy moment uh, five years ago. And so that's something to be planning for and to go back and, and research what happened uh, five years ago. So we are out of time, and we will be back in about a week or so, I hope. Uh, you have been listening to Virtues of Peace, and thank you so much, Andy and Taylor and Randy. It is your chance to say goodbye now if you want to. <laughs> Take thank care. You all, and I appreciate all those listening. Yeah. Great conversation, and uh, until next time. <laughs>